Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Finger. I'm director of the New York Eye Cancer Center and professor of ophthalmology. My specialty is the diagnosis and treatment of ocular tumors, orbital diseases, and ophthalmic radiation therapy. Part three of this series will build on what we learned in parts one and two. So far, I demonstrated the importance of the retinal pigment epithelium as it blocks imaging of the choroidal circulation and thus allows for viewing of the retinal vasculature, intraretinal microangiopathy, and select tumors. Then, we took those lessons and applied them to choroidal nevus, choroidal melanoma, and choroidal hemorrhage. Now let's examine the pathophysiology of choroidal metastasis, hemangioma, and osteoma as it relates to ophthalmic imaging. I strongly recommend your viewing part one of this series to understand the fundamentals and role of imaging in ophthalmic oncology. Now let's begin. Photography and angiography are foundational elements for my eye cancer practice. Whether the tumor is on the eyelid, conjunctiva, iris, ciliary body, retina, choroid, or optic nerve, there is nothing more real than patients actually seeing their medical problem. There is nothing more revealing than comparative imaging when evaluating tumor growth or post-treatment regression. Comparing past versus current photographic images is typically as important as correlating them with the patient's OCT, fundus autofluorescent image, or angiographic pattern. I suggest you also employ 55-inch high-resolution screens in every one of your examination rooms to help you examine diagnose and show patients their eye cancer conditions. At a minimum, there is little more satisfying to a patient than seeing their treated melanoma turn to scar. Choroidal metastasis is the most common intraocular malignancy. It typically comes from either the breast in women or lung in men. However, prostate, kidney, thyroid, and other metastatic primaries occur. That is why the patient's medical history is so important. Many of the patients will have had systemic cancer or cancers. In terms of imaging, most metastatic choroidal cancers grow quickly, are yellow, poorly demarcated, low-lying, and exude subretinal fluid. The eye cancer specialist rarely sees formed blood vessels on the surface of the tumor. I have noted that choroidal metastasis tend to grow more quickly than other cancers. Comparative photographic imaging is thus likely to reveal change over weeks rather than months. It appears that this rapid growth does not allow the time necessary to form large, formed, and thus visible tumor vessels. Consider how the relative lack of formed blood vessels affects the tumor circulation on angiography. As fluorescein dye enters the eye, then through the normal chorioretinal circulation, the small, poorly formed tumor blood vessels fill more slowly, resulting in relative hypofluorescence in the early phases of the angiogram. However, these small, incompetent vessels leak progressively, increasing fluorescence through the duration of the study. The eye cancer specialist will not see any well-developed tumor blood vessels on angiography, but will see many hyperfluorescent dot-like microaneurysms. In addition, metastatic choroidal tumors can be multifocal and bilateral. Finding and documenting all sites of metastatic disease is important for prescribing treatment. Therefore, the angiographer should take representative photographs of all retinal quadrants in both eyes or use an Equator Plus photographic machine. This choroidal metastasis demonstrates a halo of hypofluorescence surrounding a starry sky of pinpoint hyperfluorescence. Though many different choroidal tumors will demonstrate a few microaneurysms, this intense pinpoint hyperfluorescence is relatively unique to metastatic disease. Indocyanine green angiography highlights the choroidal circulation. Like with fluorescein, 
the poorly formed metastatic choroidal tumor blood vessels are slow to pick up the dye, and thus relatively hypofluorescent as seen at the end of the red arrow. In the late phase ICG angiogram, the overlying retinal vessels are no longer visible. The peripheral aspects of the tumor have retained their dye and are thus hyperfluorescent. The central aspect of the tumor still appears relatively hypofluorescent. Here is another case for review. The tumor is yellow in color. Its edges are poorly defined. The tumor is relatively low-lying with a disproportionately large, gravity-dependent, exudative retinal detachment. Here, in the late phase fluorescein angiogram, this metastatic tumor demonstrates what I call a starry sky of microaneurysms. Also note mild hyperfluorescence from its gravity-dependent exudative retinal detachment. That same tumor, examined with ICG angiography, reveals poor dye perfusion, causing relative hypofluorescence in the tumor. The secondary exudative retinal detachment is also shown and is affecting the choroid, causing intense hyperfluorescence. This metastatic lung cancer presented without a known primary. However, total body PET-CT revealed multi-organ metastasis and allowed for a bronchoscopy-enabled histopathologic diagnosis. The tumor is slightly taller than the other cases, but still relatively low-lying. There are no visible formed blood vessels on its surface. Both eyes should be carefully examined and photographed. These tumors can be multifocal and bilateral. Intraocular lymphoma is both uncommon and controversial. The natural history of this tumor is poorly understood. Likely a local manifestation of central nervous system lymphoma, it can occur prior to, synchronous with, or after the diagnosis of intracranial disease. Lymphoma deposits beneath the retinal pigment epithelium to form multifocal, infiltrative, yellow-white patches or nodules. The accompanying vitritis can make these tumors difficult to photograph. Vitreous cells are best seen by slit lamp examination of the anterior vitreous after pupillary dilation. However, the diagnosis is typically made by vitreous biopsy. Here is another example of vitreoretinal lymphoma. Note the large patches of yellow subretinal tumor are seen through a diffusely cloudy vitreous. Though injections of intravitreal methotrexate or rituximab have been employed, they carry the risks of toxicity, of intraocular injection, and such complications. At the New York Eye Cancer Center and affiliated radiation oncology centers, we typically prefer low-dose external beam radiation therapy as these tumors tend to be exquisitely sensitive to radiation. The use of low doses rarely causes radiation retinopathy and allows retreatment should the disease recur. RPE atrophy is typically seen after tumor regression. Leukemia also affects the eye. It can present as direct infiltration of the anterior segment, vitreous, choroid, and retina. It can mimic uveitis, choroiditis, and retinitis. However, the retinal form typically demonstrates white subretinal tumors surrounded by hemorrhage. Here we see another example of leukemic retinal infiltrates. Like intraocular lymphoma, white blood cells are exquisitely sensitive to radiation therapy. However, unlike intraocular lymphoma, these patients are typically younger at a mean of 26 years of age, where radiation therapy itself may be oncogenic. 
multi-specialty assessments and shared decision making are needed for these cases. Here we have another example of intraocular leukemia. This is an advanced bilateral case. However, the characteristic yellow subretinal tumor and hemorrhage can be seen. Now let's examine photography and angiography of choroidal hemangioma. These tumors are red to orange in coloration. However, some deep choroidal lesions can be covered by normal appearing tissue resulting in normal coloration. Some circumscribed tumors can demonstrate surrounding reactionary pigmentation. There is a diffused variant most commonly associated with Sturge-Weber syndrome. Overlying cystoid retinal degeneration is best seen with optical coherence tomography. Vision is most commonly affected by secondary exudative retinal detachments or a hyperopic shift due to elevation of the fovea. That said, fluorescein angiography can reveal a pathognomonic coarse vascular pattern best seen in the early phases of the study. Here are two examples of circumscribed choroidal hemangioma. Each is red in color. Their edges are well demarcated. This choroidal hemangioma is also red in color. However, its vascular pattern is pathognomonic. The coarse vascular pattern is best seen in the early phases of the fluorescein angiogram. Look at the arrow. As the fluorescein angiogram progresses from left to right, the tumor's blood vessels quickly leak, leading to a coalescing of the fluorescein hyperfluorescence. This underscores the need to image the earlier phases of the study, where the coarse vascular pattern is visible. As time goes by, the pathognomonic coarse vascular pattern disappears, leading to a relatively nonspecific diffuse hyperfluorescence. Choroidal hemangiomas contain form blood vessels that easily perfuse, leading to early choroidal filling. So get early phase imaging or an angiographic movie that starts soon after or prior to intravenous injection of the fluorescein dye. Then look for the pathognomonic coarse vascular pattern. Late phase images will merely show non-diagnostic diffuse leakage. Now let's look at a less typical case. Here we have a reddish colored tumor. However, there is evidence of atypical subretinal fibrosis and a surround of darker pigmentation. That surround of darker pigmentation has been described as a result of stimulation of choroidal melanocytes by the tumor and can be confusing. However, the fluorescein angiogram shows a coarse vascular pattern in the early AV phase. Notice the retinal arteries are filled, but the retinal veins only have laminar flow. This indicates the early phase study. Beneath the veins and the arteries, we see the coarse vascular pattern. Here we see a washout of retinal vessels in this late phase angiogram that demonstrates diffuse, homogeneous, and non-diagnostic hyperfluorescence. Clinical photographic characteristics of choroidal osteoma depend on their intraocular location. The anterior form are deep in choroid, occasionally peeking through the retinal pigment epithelium like the tip of an iceberg. These tumors are best seen with ultrasound imaging. The posterior and typically parapapillary form is resident in the anterior choroid, often touching the optic disc. These are slow-growing or long-standing tumors, thus formed blood vessels can be seen on their surface. They are low-lying tumors with low-lying exudative retinal detachments typically associated with subretinal neovascularization. In this photograph, note the CNV surrounded by hemorrhage and subretinal fluid. 
This CNV is most visible because it's at the edge of the tumor, but less obvious forms of CNV can overlie the tumor surface. Other important characteristics include well-demarcated scallop tumor edges, clumps of overlying pigment, RPE hypertrophy, and yellow color. Juxtapapillary choroidal osteomas are rarely thicker than 2 millimeters and are associated with CNV. Here is another case of choroidal osteoma. List the clinical characteristics in your mind. Note the large, well-formed blood vessel at its center. Notice the scalloped edges and the overlying hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. Now let's consider that the fluorescein dye must penetrate a bony tumor. This early phase angiogram, where there is only laminar venous return, you see relative hypofluorescence and hyperfluorescence over the surface of the tumor. There exists some early staining. However, it is these hyperfluorescent areas which should be evaluated by OCT for the presence of CNV. Here we have a very late phase fluorescein angiogram, more than 10 minutes after injection. There is almost no fluorescein in the retinal circulation. However, the bone traps the fluorescein dye, causing pathognomonic intense late staining. Also know the sharp demarcations at the tumor's edges persist. As this early phase endocyanine green ICG angiograph highlights, the dye has trouble entering the tumor, which blocks the view of the choroidal circulation. In contrast, the late phase ICG demonstrates continued blocking of the normal choroidal circulation. However, I would be remiss if I didn't add this clinical pearl. I suggest you always perform an ultrasound for suspected choroidal osteomas, with the gain turned down to a minimum, and in this case, 38 decibels, the calcific tumor echoes will persist. This is unlike other choroidal tumors. In review, fluorescein angiography of choroidal osteoma reveals poor initial fluorescein penetration associated with only mild early fluorescence. As the dye accumulates in the tumor and becomes trapped, there is progressive increased hyperfluorescence, even in the latest phases of the study. Overlying retinal pigment epithelial hypertrophy pigment will block fluorescence. Areas that contain subretinal or choroidal neovascularization will demonstrate intense hyperfluorescence. Very slow washout of the dye from the tumor over time leads to the pathognomonic finding of intense late staining. Lastly, don't forget to perform a low decibel ultrasound imaging study to see persistent high reflectivity. At this point, let's review some takeaway conclusions about fluorescein angiography of intraocular tumors. We learned that pigment blocks fluorescence. This applies for the best example, RPE hypertrophy, but it also applies to secondary hyperpigmentation like bony spicules, laser spots, and tumor pigment. It also applies to clumps of orange pigment lipofuscin seen over some choroidal nevi and many choroidal melanomas. We also saw different circulation patterns. Double circulation was best seen with the formed blood vessels associated with mushroom-shaped choroidal melanomas, endophytic retinoblastoma, and von Hippel angiomas. We also viewed the coarse vascular pattern seen in the early phases of angiography of circumscribed choroidal hemangiomas. We saw the almost pathognomonic starry sky of microaneurysms associated with choroidal metastasis.
Lastly, we learned that the early phase angiograms can be the most important and that late intense staining was noted from the bony choroidal osteoma where the dye can persist for even more than 10 minutes. This is Dr. Paul Finger. Part one of this series covered the basics of ophthalmic photography and angiography in the diagnosis of intraocular tumors. Part two covered choroidal nevus, choroidal melanoma, and choroidal hemorrhage. Part three reviewed basics of metastatic choroidal tumors, hemangioma, and osteoma. Now in part four, let's explore ophthalmic photography and angiography for retinal vascular tumors. I want you to know that the Eye Cancer Foundation was the first to support multi-center international research and education in ophthalmic oncology. A crown jewel, the Eye Cancer Foundation sponsored the first ophthalmic oncology working day at the Curie Institute in Paris, France, and the second two years later in Sydney, Australia. We will continue to do great work by helping other eye cancer specialists and their patients. We will continue to support fellowship education, particularly for doctors from unserved countries. Please consider joining us in support of the Eye Cancer Foundation. We need your help to continue this good work and expand our reach. I now invite you to view part four of this series on photography and angiography of retinal tumors and to visit our website for the Eye Cancer Foundation iCancerCure.com